There we go. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for coming. My name is Sonia. I am a community engagement lead at Narika. For those of you who don't know, Narika is a Bay Area based nonprofit which supports survivors of domestic violence and intimate partner violence, especially in the South Asian community. Narika provides free and confidential case management, counseling, safety planning, and job training for survivors of abuse for as many years as they need and entirely for free. So part of this work is prevention work, which includes engaging our communities in the conversation on issues like women's empowerment, equal rights, domestic violence, and cultural attitudes to inspire the shifts we need to end violence in our homes and communities forever. So thank you all so much for attending and thank you Prati for joining us and congratulations on uh, the successful release of your new movie. It's out on Hulu right now. Um, so to briefly introduce Prathi. So Prathi is an immigrant writer and actor from the bustling city of Chennai, India. She found herself growing up in Des Moines, Iowa, and her fire for storytelling stems from the cultural shock she experienced and the Hindu myths her mother comforted her with as a child. She's passionate about messy characters who are stuck between where they came, come from and where they are going. And she has written for iZombie for the CW, Titans on HBO Max, and most recently Plan B coming to Hulu on May 28th, which is today. So Plan B is amazing, so funny, and also so heartwarming. It follows Sunny and Lupe on their desperate journey to get access to the Plan B pill in the middle of, I think it's South Dakota, after our perfect South Asian girl, Sunny, has a one night stand at a party. So hopefully some of you have been able to watch it from our screening link. If not, go watch it this weekend. Um, and just a quick rundown of this, of this event, it is being recorded. Uh, I will ask Prathi a few questions for about 15 minutes and after that we'll open up for Q&A. So please start thinking about any questions you may have about Prathi or the movie or, or whatever um, relates to the conversation. So Prathi, my first question is really just tell us about your journey first from India to America and also toward becoming a screenwriter and joining the film industry. We'd love to hear more. Sure. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's quite a simple immigrant story, isn't it? Like I was born in India. Um, my family's family, 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 all the way back, you know, rooted in that area, rooted in that neighborhood. And um, business just was not going well. Uh, my parents had a financial downturn. And so, you know, it's when you don't, when home is not working, you just reach for whatever works, whatever you, chance you got. So my folks uh, and I, on my sixth birthday, moved to America like my parents were like happy birthday and then like hauled all my stuff <laughs> and I was like what like so it was like a really crazy thing um and we moved to Iowa and where you know it wasn't the most diverse place but I mean it was really great to to sort of have a more I guess classically all-American point of view which I think is what we sort of, why I was so inspired to put plan B in the Midwest is I think a lot of people have a very coastal sensation of what America is. When you think about it, like a lot of Americans don't really have an idea of what America is considering I, I, got, I got a couple of emails from some, from some colleagues who were like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I remember when I was in, 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 in Portland, we could just walk in and out of, you know, the store and get the plan B feel, oh yeah, the rest of the country does have this problem. And it's like, yeah, well, America's really, really big and it's really, Far more diverse than I think of what, what a lot of films and television likes to portray it as. So I mean, there was that. Um, and then my family moved to Texas and then I, then I came to Los Angeles to be a screenwriter. And like that sort of story is that when I was, my whole life I wanted to write stories uh, and I wanted to act in them, but I definitely wanted to write them. And I think the main issue, the main hindrance was that I didn't want my family's sacrifice of coming to this country to be a waste or for me to look at everything that they've done. Relatable. Yeah. And then just spit all over it with this dream that had no guarantees. Um, but then when you think about it, immigration is a dream and it has no guarantees. So maybe instead of spitting on the sea, I just expounded upon it. At least that's, that's amazing. My whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. I know that uh, a lot of people probably in, in the audience, people watching the film and even certainly myself can really relate to that, uh, you know, feeling this pressure to succeed. Uh, but oftentimes that that vision of success is very inaccessible and difficult. And um, yeah. And also just especially the Midwest, like there's so many Indians who come to like the Bay Area or like New York or, you know, maybe Oregon or something else uh, or Texas. But there's so few people who really venture out farther, even though those communities are growing at a really high rate. 
Uh, so it's amazing and really awesome that you're telling that story um, from a South Asian perspective, but like in the Midwest where, you know, these things do happen and it's, it's, it's a very different lived experience. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to ask a little bit more about your experience in Hollywood and what it's like being a South Asian woman in Hollywood. There's, it seems like so few uh, South Asian women in Hollywood. Has it gotten better and how have you navigated that? I mean, I don't know, I can't necessarily say if it's, get, it's gotten better or if it's gotten worse, because there's always this sort of like ebb and flow in terms of um, people fatigue easily, because to hire someone who is a person of color or is a female or is a young, you know, LGBT, all, LGBT, all those things, it almost feels like um, to the majority population, it kind of feels like, yeah, well, you know, I, I hired two last year and to do it again, is just a lot of work. It kind of feels like taking your medicine. Um, and then that I think is maybe the toughest thing. It's not to say that people are like, you know, so racist or, or, you know, or that, you know, everyone's hateful. It's not that at all. It's just that I think that uh, choosing to advocate for people who are people of color, it kind of feels like homework as opposed to something that can directly benefit them as well. But I think the tides in that respect are changing. Um, I still am usually like one of two people of color in a room and I can pretty much guess that our checks are probably different colors, you know? Um, but as my career is getting better, I think what I'm noticing is that even though the upper crust is pretty homogenistic, homogenous, homogenous, um, the mid-level and lower level, I think, are starting to, to diversify a little bit more. Um, so my hope, I'll hopefully say it's getting better. I, I like that positive outlook. And I think that reflects in the ending of the film too, which we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, this relates really well to my, my next question. Um, so kind of for context, uh, Narika exists predominantly just to serve South Asian populations because we recognize that there are higher rates of abuse and that they require additional cultural considerations when it comes to care. So kind of similarly in, in your movie and some of your work, why is it important that you include South Asian narratives and why is it important that Sunny in particular in Plan B is South Asian, especially for this kind of story, which often doesn't feature South Asian characters? It is specifically because there is no easy solution to her problem. Not to give too much away, I, I, I don't wanna say, say too much about the movie, um, but it is like in a lot of other cultures or a lot of other communities, when you have this problem, it may be really embarrassing and so hard, but um, you can come to your parents and say, I've got this problem, I need the plan B pill, something happened, you know, it's not good, will you help me out? And though it can be such an uncomfortable conversation, chances are it's gonna be okay at the end of the day. Um, with South Asian families and Asian families, uh, with religious families, with conservative families, that can oftentimes be seen as, yeah, that's the end of your relationship. And for a lot of people, um, it is better to stay in that relationship than to leave it because you're not just leaving a relationship, you're leaving behind your entire personal history, your entire cultural history, all the things that feel like home, that feel like memories that make you feel valuable, you will also be leaving those behind as well. So it's just, it's a non-starter, um, which is why the movie is structured the way that it does. But the ending, as you were saying, like I don't think it's the most realistic thing sometimes, but I want it to be. God, I hope it is. Yeah, I love that. I think that was perhaps one of my favorite parts about the movie. Um, I think like, for example, one of my favorite movies growing up was Bend It Like Beckham and just the struggles and, and stress of the family interaction. It's very anxiety inducing, even if it is more truthful. You just, you just sometimes want it to just work out, even if it more often than not doesn't. So I really appreciated that. And it happened for both characters too, for related to different things. Um, both Sunny and Lupe kind of had this fear of, of severe judgment and abandonment and neither of them really got that uh, to the extent that they believed it would happen. Yeah. Um, so I, I just I really appreciated that and I hope that there's more hopeful narratives like that coming that aren't necessarily just about the struggle and the trauma of being an immigrant or gay or whatever it may be and that there's hope for you know the resolution and moving forward and adjusting in the future. So thank you for doing that. It just it, it's sometimes nice to have a good story. <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, so I also just, uh, this kind of relates also to my next question. So one of my favorite jokes in Plan B is the Indian Mafia. Mm -hmm. um, it's an amazing way to show the general audience how the South Asian community works. And I think Asian American communities in general, in general, but there's like this mysterious network of aunties and uncles, which sort of report on our behavior from the shadows, kind of like spies. And yeah. It's just, it's a really great representation of stigma that exists in our community, especially around, you know, everything from like sex to divorce, domestic violence included, mm -hmm. um, which really causes us, or really inhibits open dialogue and even safety mm -hmm. um, and exists to police specifically South Asian women mostly. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about that choice and, and how, you know, the repercussions of this kind of stigma and monitoring can really affect people's like safety and health when it comes to things like preventing actual pregnancy. Do you mean that in context of the film or just in, in, in general? Both, yeah. I mean, so like with the Indian mafia thing, again, not to give, don't worry. Uh, so I, I was like, how do I like describe this? How do I describe like when I was growing up, like when I, my, my friend would drop me off at home after I helped him pick his, helped him pick his prom dates corsage and he like hugged me by and like when I walked home, I watched like the, the, the blinds of my neighbor, my Indian neighbor's house like rattle. <laughs> and I was like, oh Jesus. And like my, and then my, my mom later on got, got, got a phone call. And then I hear like the prati, like kind of thing. I, I, I was like, how do I really describe that? Or like walking home from school, I saw like, like minivans just like slow down next to me. And like, people patting themselves on the back and congratulating themselves and each other for s essentially spying on underage girls and, re and, and, and reporting on their every behavior, whether or not that behavior was factually occurring. I was like, how, how, do, I, how do I distill that? And, and then when I was describing that to John and Hayden, uh, executive producers on the, on the, on the, on the movie uh, who I first pitched this to, they're like, yeah, I guess it's kind of like a mafia don, like kind of like a, like a network of spies. So that's kind of how, how we kind of coined that as just the easiest way of describing the, the acute knowledge that it's not paranoia. If you drop the ball, if you mess up in some way, if you got caught, you know, drinking beers in a friend's minivan, for instance, um, it's not that people might hear about it or, or what if I get in trouble? It's, it is a foregone conclusion. You're dead meat like and so I think that is the main difference between growing up as maybe in a more marginalized population as opposed to, to the general population it was that the mar the general population gets to think like what if something goes wrong you know what if I get caught the marginal population is my ass is dead I'm going to get caught and the highest form of punishment is going to be rained upon my head and then everyone will know about it and because the community talks so much it will never be forgotten so that my parents' shame will cause them to punish me so much more. And it's not that I even have terrible parents. I have wonderful parents. I, I live in Los Angeles. I became a screenwriter. I'm the luckiest person in the world. And even then, I knew, like, they, like the community will never let them forget. And so they have to, they'll, they'll think like, oh, we have to repunish her so that she'll never forget also. And that can be a tremendously traumatizing thing because like a very small moment of experimentation becomes like a decade long situation that you cannot scrub off of your body. And then you just feel more guilt and more shame and more guilt and more, and more shame. That compounding interest of negativity isn't gonna do anybody any good ever. Yeah, yeah, I think you put that into words so well, you know, just now and also in, in the film itself. Uh, it, it's just the, the judgment can often be so punitive that we oftentimes like there's just a lot of fear about even sharing things and Sunny has the same experience like she's so terrified the whole film about just telling her mom the truth of what happened and she loves her mom like they're you know the best of pals like for a long time but even so just this this fear of what will happen it, it's it just penetrates all levels of you know your society and everything that you do and I think also just the choice to make the pharmacist as well South Asian, as opposed to, you know, a white man would probably maybe would do the same thing in South Dakota. But the fact that this man is also part of, you know, the Indian mafia, I think adds some layers too that I think, again, probably maybe wouldn't happen in real life, but I think it, it lends some, some more significant truth to that. Actually, it does happen in real life. We, we went to great lengths to make sure that every law 
that is present in this film is real and is currently occurring. So the conscience clause is real and it currently occurs. It's currently active in six states, most highly seen in the Dakotas. And the conscience clause is disgusting. It is insidious. It is so wrong, um, but it is very real. Uh, uh, yeah. Atheists can, can look at you and just decide on personal belief that they no longer want to do their jobs and give you uh, medicine. They, they, they can say, I do not want to give you contraception of any kind. Um, I just choose not to. And the thing is, it's a case by case basis, which means that they can look at you and say, you get it. And they can look at me and say, you don't get it. Yeah, it's absolutely unfair and ridiculous that that still happens in this country. Um, yeah, I was mainly speaking to the fact that he was also part of the mafia, but I, you know, I love that touch. I thought, I thought it was brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to talk about the relationship between Sunny and Lupe, because this is another part that I also really appreciated as I was watching. I feel like in a lot of these kinds of movies, there's always a very serious falling out and there's just a lot of trouble that the, the relationship between the main characters go through. And there was, you know, a small fallout in the film, but it was, I felt it was short lived and in a good way. Like, I think the, the strength of their relationship was carried much more, much more and had a stronger emphasis than a lot of other films were. And there was just much less like judgmentalism I, I saw between the two characters. Um, so why is it necessary for women and girls to witness and practice this kind of, uh, you know, symbiotic, supportive relationship? Because I don't think you have to learn how to love someone. I think you always had it. It's always inside of you. And sometimes you have to put words to it, but mostly you just feel it and you see it. Like you, you don't need to test a friendship to know that it's a good, beautiful, wonderful friendship. Um, and I think maybe the patriarchy, maybe, maybe like a shoddy narrative structure, maybe external pressure makes people feel like you have to prove your love to someone. But that's not true. I think, um, especially also when it comes to things like um, women's health among women, there, I, I feel like there's just like an intrinsic understanding that even if you're on the worst terms with someone, if you're like, I have this problem and it involves my uterus, I feel like most women are like, let's go, let's go. We'll, go, let's go, we'll go to Vegas, we'll go to the UN, we'll go to Mars. I understand intrinsically. It's just one of those like deep DNA things. I think it's also so much like, you know, like the Indian mafia where like Indian people see that and they're like, oh yeah, I get it. You know, like I think women see, you know, I need to get the plan B pill and I don't have enough time and I'm so fucked. Ooh. You're good. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's like, yeah, let's just go. Let's just go. And I, I don't want to, again, I, I don't want to spoil anything that, that, that occurs with, with Lupe's story, but what she also goes through, you know, the ending reveal is not like, oh my God, what? A, a real one, you know? It's just sort of yeah. like, of course I love you. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. And I, I also agree. I think like it doesn't necessarily require great acts or great moments of realization it's just like those little things like yeah of course I'll do this thing or I'll help you out uh, and I also really like that how, how you said kind of like Indian mock it's like the inverse of that exactly it's like the the women's alliance <laughs> I don't know what you would call it but um, that's something we need more of I just wish it, we saw more of it so I'm glad you really chose to include that thanks I feel like what I wanted to say with the movie is that the world can be really tough structures out, out there can be to like kneecap you and shaft you and tell you what you are and what you're worth and maybe your worth is between your legs that's all it is but that doesn't mean it's accurate that does not mean it's true that people are far more good and far more beautiful and far more kind than they're oftentimes given the chance to express yeah that that, that yeah again that's really beautiful and, and motivational and uh, hopefully other people see that too in the film because I definitely did so <laughs> um, so I just have one last question then after that we'll move into Q&A from the audience so if you have any start you can feel free to use the chat or start thinking about it um, so my last question is so I, as I mentioned we're a nonprofit which supports survivors of domestic violence especially in the South Asian immigrant community 
So why is it important that we show South Asian women like Sunny who are empowered or at least learn empowerment and South Asian women in relationships also of any kind, you know, friendships as well that are healthy and mutually beneficial as a part of the movement to change our culture and end violence? Because a lot of what we see is women turning against each other, not knowing how what a healthy relationship is, um, not knowing what they want or having the confidence to pursue what they want or being afraid of, of stigma as we've already discussed. So. Uh, why is it important that specifically South Asian women are able to see these kinds of narratives? I think because the the, the culture can, again, as we spoke about earlier, uh, police and peck at women uh, until they just don't even know what their own values are, what they're what they're good for in this world. You know, I think so many people try to assign your value to your chastity, to your virginity, or to your having sex, you know, any of those you know, where you can oftentimes get, get, get exoticized, but then also at home within your, your community, if you have so much as, you know, thought of a penis, you're, you're, you're dirty sort of thing. It's just a, a really awful, awful thing. But so I think it's extremely important for South Asian women to sort of have an example of what it is to reach out to somebody um, and not be rebuffed and not be thought of as less than in in any capacity at all. I think that was so, so imperative. I think it's also really important to show that like South Asian women, even though have been neutered in general, can still be horny. And that is not a sin. Like Sunny masturbates, she has sex, she fantasizes like a lot. Like there was a line that eventually didn't make it in the, in the, in the film, but she's ranting about how, how horny she is. And she literally says, someone just put a finger in me, someone, anyone sort of thing. <laughs> and like, it is not a sin to be a person with a three-dimensional capacity of life. Like it's not like losing your virginity, it's not losing anything. It's gaining a new facet of your lived experience. You're on this earth one damn time. And if you don't get a chance to express who you are as a person, because the rest of the world just keeps pecking at you, I think that's a broken way to live. And expressing your full self should not mean it should not mean that you're living at the expense of your loved family members or your friends or your community. Um, so that's I, I want to make that extremely explicitly quite clear. Yeah. That, that's amazing. And I, I know I was also like, this is so great. Like, it's not something that's ever been done before. And I, I, at least I can't really think of many examples in which South Asian women like on a main screen or on like a main pl a platform like Hulu um, are given like the opportunity to explore that kind of sexual freedom. So I, that is in a sense, very empowering. Um, I can I, I can just imagine and see like the aunties watching and being like oh, you know horrified just watching it it's just I, I'm sure maybe it's better know if you've had people in your family who have been like oh, Prati wrote this <laughs> but <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, yeah I mean I, I I do think it's it's sort of like I do think it's really fun to talk about that kind of stuff and like why not? Why why not enjoy yourself? Why not have some have some sort of fun with this? Why not horrify some aunties? Like, what's so wrong with that? You know, um, it's almost like a sense of beautiful defiance that if someone's going to be watching you from here to Timbuktu all damn day, give them something to see. Like, there's something gutsy about that that I I never really did when I was under surveillance that that much, um, but I. But if there's a, one girl or one guy, anyone who like manages to have a respectful conversation with their trusted adults about this sort of content, consider myself a very happy person. Job well done. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's precisely what we're trying to do more of at Narika is just uh, you know, even initiate dialogue from parents to their kids, for example, and just like how to talk about sex and things like that. Because so many times, like, they just, I mean, at least I know, like, I, and others that I know, their talks are like, do you know what this is? Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> like, there's just so much fear and shame and just like, we don't want to touch this thing. So uh, hopefully, you know, our work, your work, all of it together, media, not media, whatever it is, it kind of slowly over time will encourage more dialogue so that there's not as much stigma, there's not as much shame, and then things like violence and abuse, um, you know, sex shaming, all of this stuff won't happen again. Absolutely.
like making sure that uh, women's vaginas are not considered public property. Is- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that inclu- uh, concludes my question. So now it's open to all of you. You can go ahead and either unmute or just post in the chat. I think we have time for just a few uh, in the time that we have left. So please post them out as fast as you can. And thank you so much. That was amazing. My pleasure. Um, okay, so a few people have raised their hands. I think Misha. Okay. Yeah, I saw Misha. Go ahead, Misha. Hey. It's so, hi, you guys. It's so nice to meet you. Um, I have seen the film. Um, it was so good. I loved it. Um, it. Yeah, it resonated with me. I grew up in the South. Um, I grew up in a very small town in Louisiana. And there's parts of that that really like spoke to me, the, the kind of characters you bump into in the middle of the night at a gas station, that kind of stuff was really funny. And the characters at, the, at school, it was just so brilliantly done. Um, I was just curious about, I'm, I'm an actor. Um, I'm Pakistani American. I work in Hollywood. I'm in Los Angeles as well. And I hear you about like being the only person in a room who is, yeah, not only like a representative of like the South Asian community, but just like the only person of color in a room. It happens very often. So I was just curious, like, well, when you, how, how is it pitching your, your film? Um, how was it received? And, um, you know, because for me, it's just like, this was such a great film and it resonated with me so deeply. And I would hope to hear that people gave it a big thumbs up, but, you know, I just wanted to hear more about that process. Sure. I mean, I think I had a slightly unusual process. Um, I, I don't know because this encompasses um, a lot of general experiences, but in, in mine, um, I met with Matt Lottman, who was the executive at um, Herbert and Schlossberg, uh, the guys who did Harold and Kumar at the time, who, you know, turn up, they're, they're white. I was like, what? You guys like <laughs> nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I was like shocked for one thing, but then went in for that meeting with my writing partner who's Asian. And I was like, um, so like we are Harold and Kumar. <laughs> so it was, there was never any kind of like, you think we should make Sonny white? None of that ever. Like, because yeah. they're Harold and Kumar guys. So um no I there it was a very well received it was there was never a moment of a, a pushback on their their the, the melanin of it all ever um yeah it's pretty easy actually in that way that's fantastic awesome yeah. Thank you. well yeah that's that's my that was my only question about yeah just pitching and when that experience so but thanks thanks very much the movie's great love thank it. you for sharing and asking um Justin do you want to go ahead yeah, hello. Um, I just want to first say thank you for uh, letting us see this movie before its release. And uh, thank you probably for um, including all the like subtle details about the Indian Mafia and like, you know, bringing up issues such as the conscious clause and all that. And um, I was just wondering, being in California, do you see a difference in access to contracepti- contraceptives between yeah. like yeah. here in the South? Yeah. Yes. 100%. You almost, like, it, it, it's almost like walking down West Hollywood, people are just handing you condoms. It's like, I'm not joking. Like it's, it's really, it's pretty uh, free out here. Um, there's very minimal stigma. You feel far less watched. I and mean, when I was in Texas, I, I, I went, I literally had to get the morning off mm-hmm. once um, and went to the pharmacy and there was literally an auntie there who was like, how old are you? And I was like, I'm 20 for kind of thing um and and she was like uh-huh kind of thing and she like gave me a lecture as she was giving me this medicine but out here it's like I, I think maybe the threshold for shock or maybe even just tolerance um it's a different picture totally different story mm-hmm. yeah, thank you thank you thank you for your question do we have any more Oh, it looks like we have one. What was your favorite scene to write and favorite scene in the film from Nina? Ooh, okay. So there were two favorite scenes for me to write um, and two that I really, really fought for. Uh, one was, and I'm not, I can't spoil, I'm not, okay. One was in a playground where there was some jewelry involved. Yes. 
um, that film, that scene, like when I pitched it, uh, people were like, whoa, <laughs> or what kind of thing. But I was like, this is real. People actually do this. And like, I, I, and I think understandably the, the two guys that I pitched it to were like, you know, like that's really far. But I was like, yeah, yes. And, and it, I, I, and then Hulu called later on and let them know that it was a scene that they really liked. And I'm, and, and like, they, they really only, the two people that I pitched to, they really only had like one or two moments of like doubt. And after that, like, it was like, everyone was on board. Everyone was like, yes, this is, we'll, we're, this is an R rated movie kind of thing. Um, that was really fun. And then the other was the parking lot. Like a Sunny says a four word sentence that I've thought a thousand times when I'm crying. Um, and that was probably the most meaningful thing to me, personally. Thank you for sharing. Um, Rachel asks, what's the next raunchy comedy you'd like to gender flip? <laughs> uh, as in like, I mean, oh, there's so many of them. Oh God, so many. I mean, the next raunchy comedy I'd like to gender flip. I really want to do something that kind of feels like almost like Fast and the Furious. <gasps> That's amazing. Yeah, like I kind of want like chases or like either that or um, if you ever watch the Raid franchise, which was just basically the action movies where I'm like, they're actually punching people. Like there's no way, this is insane. Like that's what I want to do. Something where like, there's like a lady, I'm like, there needs to be a weight minimum for these women, like 130 pounds and above, you know, like who's just like yoked as hell in a car shredding some rubber or punching people in the face like just something intense visceral yeah for sure well I would watch that <laughs> okay uh so I think we have time for one more question if anyone wants to share otherwise we may close down I know we're a little past our time one last question from anyone oh here we go um, uh, is that a question, Pushpa? Hi, everyone. Hello. Pratik, hi. Uh, the so question is, uh, there is a Telugu film, just the plan B is the Telugu film. Is there any, any way that you are inspired by any topic related to that regional movie, Telugu film, plan B? I haven't seen it. Uh, okay. All right, know. okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's very cool. I didn't know that uh, there's a mainland Indian film about Plan B. Is relating to different kind of Plan B or? Uh, um, it's a regional movie. It's a Telugu movie. So I, I was just wondering that uh, by any chance did you get inspired by watching any regional movie or anything that is that you have been you know watching or you know. I mean, I inspired by Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Basically, we, we, we pitched it as a female Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, but instead of burgers, it's uh, birth control. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's not something I ever would have imagined would be, I guess, remade or, or, or twisted, but it works really well. <laughs> okay. okay, so thank you all so much uh, for attending. Um, please go watch the film if you haven't already. And um, really quickly, I will just share um, if you know of anyone who does need help with any kind of related domestic violence concern, you can contact Narika here um, and receive any of these free and confidential services. Um, if you want to learn more, you can follow us on social media. And if you have uh, you know, the availability to support, uh, you can donate at naric.org slash support and all of those funds directly support our survivors with uh, emergency hotel stay and transportation to shelters, um, emergency financial aid, legal support, housing support, and all of that. So, um, but otherwise, thank you guys so much for attending. Uh, have a great weekend and um, yeah, enjoy, enjoy your movie watching. Thank you guys so much for having me. Really yes, thank you so much, Prati. It's so great to meet you and talk to you. Yeah. Pleasure.